They have lived by these waters since the beginning of time. The land and the sea has been good to them, feeding hundreds of generations of coastal people, shaping every aspect of their lives. This coast is who they are. If it is poisoned, then so are they. If it is healthy, then so are they. Alberta's oil sands. It is called the single most environmentally destructive project on the planet. Polluting great rivers, poisoning landscapes and downriver First Nations communities, and creating Canada's single largest emitter of greenhouse gases, contributing towards global warming. The oil that the tar sands produce has earned itself the title of the dirtiest oil on earth. When Barack Obama declared his intentions to reduce America's dependence on dirty oil, the companies decided it was time to find a new market. One of those new markets is Asia. But in order to transport the oil, they must construct what is being called the most ambitious pipeline project in North America, and then ship the crude oil overseas via some of the world's largest oil tankers. This is called Project Gateway, proposed by Enbridge Incorporated. Canada's largest oil and gas pipeline company. The pipeline would carry half a million barrels of crude oil every day from the tar sands in Alberta, 1,200 kilometers overland to the town of Kitimat. Condensate would be carried in the opposite direction. These pipelines would cross the headwaters of the Fraser, Skeena, and Mackenzie watersheds, approximately 900 streams and rivers in 56 First Nations territories. Once in Kitimat, the oil would be loaded onto crude oil tankers, tankers the size of several football fields. About 225 tankers every year would transit the BC coast, carrying millions of barrels of crude oil and condensate. These tankers would navigate the same inshore waters where the Queen of the North sank. This route is far more narrow and dangerous than Prince William Sound, where the Exxon Valdez ran aground in 1989. These massive tankers must navigate rock gardens and reefs. This region regularly sees hurricane force winds, strong enough to tear apart lighthouse stations and damage infrastructure. Many of these tankers will pass right by the village of Hartley Bay, where the Gitgat people still rely heavily on the marine resources for sustenance, livelihood, and culture. In the tradition of their ancestors, the Gitgat still obtain much of their food from the land and the sea. Following the seasons, much of the community travels to their traditional seaweed and fish camps, where they pick hundreds of pounds of seaweed from the shore at low tide and then dry it on the rocks in the hot sun. With the ocean, every season brings another harvest. In the summer and fall, there is salmon. In the winter, there is clams. Spring brings seaweed and herring eggs and year-round they hunt birds and marine mammals. Tourism is playing an increasing role in the economy of these coastal First Nations as their territory is part of the Great Bear Rainforest, a world-renowned global treasure of biodiversity and ecological wonders. Every year, thousands of visitors travel from around the globe to witness true wilderness and wild ecosystems, something that most places have long since lost. Here, they come to see the rare white spirit bear, the grizzlies, eagles, whales, dolphins, and whatever else the coast chooses to reveal on any given day. The shoreline is the feed basket for both wildlife and people. They often refer to it as their supermarket and marvel at the abundance the sea bestows upon them just as it has for thousands of years. It's hard to believe that one accident could destroy all of this. But that's exactly what happened several hundred miles north of here, the day an oil tanker ran aground. It sits stranded like a giant wounded animal all through the morning, bleeding its cargo of North Slope crude at a rate of 20,000 barrels an hour. 
one drunk captain was all it took. In 1989, an oil tanker named the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, Alaska, spilling 40 million liters of crude oil into the ocean, contaminating over a thousand miles of coastline. Thousands of locals worked day and night in an attempt to clean up the oil. Many couldn't help but inhale the toxic fumes during the cleanup, and as a result, many people still suffer with severe health problems. In the end, they were only able to recover about 3%. The oil killed untold numbers of birds, fish, and marine mammals, destroying local fisheries, economies, and communities. Overnight, their way of life changed forever. Nothing prepares you for something of that magnitude. There is nothing that can prepare you for for the pain, for the, for the anger that you feel. Everybody felt the pain, everybody understood the pain. The oil spill created a problem that never existed before. I don't think there was ever a time where, where Native people were forced to stop harvesting certain resources. Twenty years later, there is still toxic oil in the beaches in Prince William Sound. We haven't eaten clams in our area since immediately after that. We still today cannot consume any clams. Their toxicity level is way up. Is it ever going to get clean? I don't think it's ever going to be the same after, after all that oil's been on our beaches. Overnight, fishing licenses, which were once the family nest eggs, became worthless. During the years of court battles that followed, Exxon did everything they could to avoid paying compensation to those who lost their livelihoods, their health, and their lives. Meanwhile, Exxon went on to become the richest corporation in history. British Columbia is next on the list, if Enbridge has its way. Enbridge. Enbridge is aggressively campaigning governments, First Nations, and communities with promises of prosperity and safety. They put forth the image of having state-of-the-art technology that never fails. The world's longest, safest, most advanced energy transportation network. However, their PR image is far from the truth. We start tonight with another Enbridge oil spill less than two months after a pipe burst in Calhoun County spilling oil into West Michigan's waterways. It's happened again. This time, it's in Illinois. And again, Enbridge is to blame. Right now, the company isn't sure how much oil actually leaked from the spill site. We've told you a lot about the Enbridge over the past two months, and we know that that company has had a number of spills in recent years. Earlier this year in North Dakota, there was an Enbridge leak of some 126,000 gallons. There were two major spills in Wisconsin in 2007. Enbridge pipelines have sprung a dozen leaks in Michigan alone since 2003. Another mess for Enbridge. Hard to believe we're talking about this so soon. Enbridge pipelines have had over 700 spills in the last 10 years alone. This is the same company that is planning to build a pipeline that would cross over 900 of our sensitive streams and rivers. However, once the oil is transferred to tankers, it is no longer the responsibility of Enbridge. The safety of the British Columbian coast then lies in the hands of whichever foreign shipping company happens to land the contract. Even with current technology, every year sees an average of five major oil spills worldwide. Even with double-hull tankers, 
even with tether tugs. Because it threatens the basis of their culture, coastal First Nations firmly oppose the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline. Basically told government and industry that we'll do anything, in our, everything and anything in our power legally, um, on, on, out in the streets and, and politically and otherwise to, to stop this project. All it would take would be one spill, one spill. And all of those jobs that we've trained our people for, all of those people that have hope in our communities, it would be over. At the low tide, I can go out and get my clams. I can go and get my crab. I go out and get bark. I have um, a connection with the spirit and with the um, ancestors from long ago. There's, I think the First Nations people in Haida have a much broader, much deeper understanding of what wealth actually is. As long as you keep on the same page, all working together, we can go through, we can protect our lands, we can protect our peoples, we can protect our air. And this is what we need to do, not, as I stated earlier, not only in British Columbia, but all over the world. This is a major threat. If we're going to produce 30% of all greenhouse gases from one project and we're enhancing it, we're as guilty as everybody else for allowing this to happen. Oh, the impacts of uh, something going wrong affects not just one small uh, one small portion of the coast. If we have an impact, something like the Exxon Valdez, uh, you can see the masses, massive area that that would encompass, and that encompasses so many First Nations uh, along the coast. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of resources that are taken from the First Nations uh, traditional territories that are traded with other First Nations on the interior. So there is an impact to that trade, that, that relationship that we have with other First Nations um, throughout BC. But Enbridge doesn't seem to be listening. Enbridge is blatantly ignoring First Nations position on the Northern Gateway Pipeline and forging ahead with the development of the project. Enbridge has hundred million dollars and the best public relations tactics money can buy to create the impression that their project is safe. But we know better. Join us in protecting what sustains our communities, our livelihoods, our food, our ecosystem, our culture, and our spirits. <laughs>